Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State and Gotham Gazette, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. New Yorkers will be voting in state party primary elections on Thursday, September 13th, for seats including governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and the state legislature, with its 150 assembly seats and 63 state senate seats, only some legislative seats include primaries. The state Senate is the upper chamber of the New York legislature. Along with the assembly, it works to pass bills that can then be signed or vetoed by the governor. Legislators work with the governor to both craft and change laws and to establish a state budget. One very closely watched race this election season is here in Manhattan, between the Democrats vying to represent State Senate District 31. Today, you will hear from three of the four candidates running in that primary including the incumbent senator. The 31st State Senate District covers several neighborhoods along the west side of Manhattan, stretching as far south as Chelsea, all the way up to Inwood. The seating order for today's debate was chosen at random. The candidates joining us are incumbent Senator Marisol Alcantara and challengers Robert Jackson and Thomas Leone. A fourth challenger, Terso Pina, declined our invitation. So thank you all for being here. And the first question starts with you, Senator Alcantara, and that is, describe for voters, describe for people watching, what is the job of a New York State Senator? Go ahead. The job of a New York State Senator is to legislate, um, to provide constituent services to your district, but also to come out with new and innovative ideas on how to move the state of New York forward. Mr. Jackson, how do you capture the job of a state senator? State Senator's job is to be the representative of all of the people in the district. Uh, one is from a legislative point of view, dealing with legislative processes and budget in the State Senate. Uh, half of the job, or even more than that, is dealing with constituent issues in the community. Uh, but overall, it's listening to the people, um, going up to Albany, fighting for the causes that the people of our district want and need. That's the job of a New York State Senator. Thank you. And Mr. Leon, how do you describe the job of a state senator? Uh, the job of the state senate is to legislate the law. But if I become elected, I will be concentrated and solve the issues that our community have. I will mention it the example. For example, the small business owners, they are working very hard to pay the, the rent and they also cannot afford it, like I do. I have I also a small business owner. Uh, for example, the Im immigrant population is not getting priority. And there are a bunch of issues that we have to face as a state senator. So we need like two or three hours to discuss all the issues. Well, we've got a little bit of time, but that actually takes us into the second question. So why don't you just keep going, talk a little bit more about the issues facing the district. The second question is, what are the top two or three issues that you believe right now, and I'll get into others after, so we got, but what do you believe are the top issues facing the district? Have, Go ahead. We have a serious problem with housing. The obvious increase of the rent, we got problem, you see, with the, we have to improve the services for the senior citizens and all bunch of stuff that we have to, to face. Okay, Senator Alcantara, your answer, the top issues facing the district? To me, the top three issues facing the issue are housing, immigration, and education. In terms of housing, I have provided over $350,000 in funding to organizations in the district that can provide legal assistance to folks that are losing their home or have problems with their home. We, we have done town housing workshops all throughout the district um, with uh, many attorneys so our constituents can go and ask questions. We have an attorney in-house that constituents can come and take care of their housing issue. In terms of immigration. Um, I worked with the governor very closely to create the first in the nation immigrant legal defense fund where we provided over $15 million of funding um, to pro, um, for organizations all throughout New York State to provide representation to both documented and undocumented immigrants. In this age where immigrants feel like they're being attacked, um, we thought that that was a wonderful idea for New York to handle that problem. 
third, education. I have provided over 2.5 million in funding to different schools through our district. I worked very closely with the UFT, which is endorsing me, to create three teacher centers all through our neighborhood that would help reduce the number of students that are English learners. I have also provided over $400,000 in funding to CUNY in the Heights to provide training English as a second language and so on. And last but not least, um, along with the City of University of New York, I provided $1.5 million in funding to create a campus of Manhattan Community College in Upper Manhattan so our students don't have to travel downtown. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jackson, top issues facing the district. Affordability of housing is a primary issue. Uh, when you look at up in Albany, as far as the Republicans and uh, our state senator and the IDC, they have basically uh, stopped progressive legislation that deals with the vacancy decontrol, that deals with preferential rent, that deals with the Ernstat law that would give New York City the opportunity to govern itself. That's been held up by the Republicans in the state Senate, and our state senator is part of the problem. But that's number one. As far as number two, uh, education. Education, the state of New York, owes the state schools $3.4 billion, and how much in New York City? $1.8 billion, which has been passed by the New York State Assembly, but not passed by the New York State Senate. And in fact, I walked to Albany in the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit, which uh, resulted in $16 billion for the children of New York City. But uh, while I walk, our state senator, who's sitting next to me, walked off the floor uh, when it came to voting for our children's education. The assembly said, yes, we will phase up money over two years. The state senator and others walked off the floor so they would, the vote would not be counted. Number so, three, so, as far as ahead, immigration ahead. reform, the DREAM Act, which deals with children that have come here young and want to get a college education, that's been held up by the Republicans. The Liberty Act, which calls for a sanctuary state uh, where uh, state officials would not uh, co corroborate with ICE to deport people. people. Uh, the Republicans have held that up in the New York State Senate, and the IDC, which Marisol is part of it, is part of the problem. The people of the I'm district want change, I'm and that's what this is about. Okay, so there's a few things for you to respond to there. We can start, uh, I suppose, with this question around whether your membership in the Independent Democratic Conference, which was uh, until a few months ago, a group of eight senators, including yourself, that had their own conference and agreed to sort of a coalition government with the Senate Republicans that had a one-seat majority and made it into a, a nine-seat majority in the state Senate. How do you respond to the accusations that the IDC, by uh, working with Republicans, blocked improvements to rent regulations and more education funding? Well, uh, there, were, uh, there are 63 senators in the state of New York and 32 Republicans, 31 Democrats. The IDC dissolved in April, and even when we came together as a Democratic majority, we saw that we brought issues to the floor, and we were never able to pass them. We brought a hostile amendment for the DREAM Act. We were not able to do it, united as a Democratic majority. We brought the comprehensive reproductive right. We were not able to do it. I believe my record speaks for itself. I brought in a record of investment in our community. That's why I have been endorsed by the two teachers union because of the work that I have done in education. Like I said, we have created three teacher centers to reduce the class size. Uh, Latina, a uh, big part of our district has a high percentage of Latinos. We created uh, mental health programs in 10 of our schools to address the issue of teenage suicide amongst Latina women. We did uh, many college fairs in the district, brought in a number of colleges to help out. Like I said, we did a record investment in CUNY uh, to bring in a campus to our district. We brought in arts program into our school, music program. So, so let, me, let me follow up on that because you also listed some other uh, funding allocations that you brought back to the district in your prior answer. So. You were elected two years ago. This is your first term. Correct. Uh, you're, fi you're finishing up now. You're hoping for a second. That was basically your calculation that by joining the IDC, you would help bring more resources back to your district. Is that sort of the general calculation for, for your constituents, your voters? That's what you say. I, I joined this conference, and yes, we aligned with, with Republicans, 
but we couldn't have had a Democratic majority anyway, and I was able to then bring resources back to the district. Does that capture it well? No, I joined the ID. When I ran for office, I reached out to all the Democratic establishment in the city of New York. Um, I spoke to them of the idea that I was a Bernie Sanders delegate. I'm a feminist. I'm progressive. I'm a trade unionist. Uh, there were no Latinas in the state of New York. No one from the entire establishment supported or were interested in bringing some label of diversity to the state Senate. I had a prior relationship with Diane Savino, who came out of the labor movement like I did. And that's how I came in contact, and that's how I joined the IDC. If you look at my voting record, I have a 100 percent um, voting record of approval from the League of Conservation Voters. My record on environmental, on labor movement have been amazing. I, my bill to have all orders of protection for domestic violence victim was adopted into the budget. My car check bill to protect public sector unions was adopted by the governor of New York. Okay, so let me stop so, you there, Mr. Jackson. Like yeah, yeah, your case that uh, Senator Alcantara and the IDC have stopped progressive legislation from passing that would have passed without an IDC. What, how, what's the that people argument? People of the district, ex when, when Marisol said that she, no one supported her, it was an open seat. Uh, the establishment really does not support an open seat. Everyone is open to run, uh, and she ran, and I ran, and, and two other people ran. And the bottom line is that uh, the people based on uh, uh, voted for her with only one-third of the vote. But here's the difference. The difference is the people of the district are progressive Democrats that want a leader that's going to stand up and fight the system. They're going to fight the Republicans, the Trump Democrats that are basically holding up everything. She talked about what she brought to the district. Here's an example. She, they, she's playing a three-card Monty game with respects to education. The district, the 31st Senatorial District, which goes to Midtown, the Upper West Side, and all of Northern Manhattan, is owed $55 million by the Campaign for Fiscal Equity when she walked off the floor. $55 million. Those children that have lost all of that money can never recapture it because, you know, the Juan Pablo Duarte School, PS 132, one of the founders of the Dominican Republic, owes owed $1 million a year. She showed up with a, a mock check for $50,000 for air conditioning. That is peanuts. That's part of the shell game that's being played on the people of our district. They need a change, and that's why all of the Democratic clubs in, in the district has endorsed me. That's why almost every elected public official except two have endorsed me. That's why all of these groups, 60 of them on the steps of City Hall, Action Potluck, True Blue New Let York, all are supporting me. Senator Alcantara mentioned that she has the support of these two uh, education uh, leader unions, the teachers union, principals union. Why, why would they be supporting her if she had a bad record on education and education funding? Sure. Well, obviously, you know that the governor sat down with Andrea Stewart Cousins and Jeff Klein at a press conference, which we all heard, and basically the governor tried to put together a formula that basically said that we will support the uh, people that have come back. But if you really look at it, after that press conference, several days later, the IDC, the Independent Democratic Conference, put out they're holding a fundraiser, not for all of the Democrats of the state Democratic uh, uh, Party, but only of the IDC, with $1,000 and $5,000 a plate. And who attended that? Real estate money, hedge funds, charter school money. And that's what it is. It's a sham that's being played on the, on the people of New York City. Four years ago, there was a deal that broke down, and everyone expects that this will not hold. The governor is looking at running for mayor, I mean, for the president, and he's trying to put this together. But the bottom line is, this has occurred for years, and the governor has allowed this to happen. The time so is now to bring, for change. I'm going to bring uh, Mr. Leon back in, in in just one second. Senator Alcantara, can you uh, explain a little bit? The, the IDC did not necessarily make a Republican majority, but right. if instead of uh, 40 seats, between the IDC and the Senate Republicans combined, if it was 32-31 with a, a strength in Democratic conference and perhaps trying to uh, persuade Senator Felder from Brooklyn, who has made that 32 majority for the Senate Republicans, 
wouldn't it be closer to how you brand yourself as a progressive, as a Democrat, to stick with the Democrats and try to figure out a way to put more pressure on the Republicans and put more pressure on Senator Felder? Do you have any regrets about making that choice? I don't. Um, let me address some of the issues that he brought up. The fundraiser that we had in Washington Heights was a fundraiser to raise funds for Shelley Mayer, who was running for senator in Yonkers. And we, all the members of the IDC, donated $10,000 apiece for Shelley Mayer. I am running for this district, and I represent this district proudly because of the work that I have done on immigration. I carry the bill to keep ICE out of the courthouse. I carry the bill to uh, make, instead of you get arrested for hopping the subway or a minor misdemeanor, instead of them giving you a ticket or something for 365 days, would, would let ICE know that you could be deported? That's my bill, that instead of 364 days, 65 days, can make it 364 days. I am an immigrant. I was born out of this country. Uh, for Mr. Jackson to sit here, the teachers' union, I take their endorsement with pride because I'm a trade unionist. And I believe that teachers are not here to... Uh, they didn't endorse Governor Cuomo. I am the only IDC member that they endorse, and it's because of my record on education. And I do not believe that unions should be demonized or that unions are special interests. Unions look out for the children of New York, for the working class people, and for teachers. And I am proud to have the endorsement of the UFT. So I think on one hand, there's uh, a lot of people that give you credit for some of the bills, some of the funding that you've mentioned, and some of the votes that you've taken. On the other hand, even with uh, some of that record, the money trail from, as has already been said, real estate interests and charter school interests, education reform interests that heavily, heavily funds the IDC, and that money then went to help get you elected two years ago and, and since has continued to flow into you. How do you reconcile your record, but also the membership in the IDC and the, the money that's flowed in from the interests that you say you're opposed to? For example, I voted for charter school to be capped. I have voted for more transparency in the ways charter school operate. Just because they gave me money, it has not stopped my vote on how I feel and what I think is the best for the students of my district. I am supported by TWU. I believe in congestion pricing. So just because someone, I am not the only Democrat in the state of New York that receives money from real estate. Um, we have people that are running for office that have received money for real estate. My record speaks for itself. The work that I have done in the district in terms of immigration, I have been supported by every major labor union in the state of New York. 1199, DC 37. They are not supporting me because they think I'm tied to special interests. They have seen the work that I have done for working class New Yorkers and for the people in my okay, district. Let me stop you there. Mr. Leon, tell us, uh, tell, you know, both of your competitors on the stage were on the ballot two years ago. Mr. Jackson is well known from being a city council member and, and he's run for other offices. Tell voters a little bit more about who you are, what makes you qualified to become a state senator. So good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Leon. Thank you, MNM, my Manhattan Neighborhood Network, for inviting me and be, being fair because I was excluded from New York One. And yesterday, I, I was very lucky. I became grandpa for the second time. My daughter have a beautiful and healthy baby. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Thank tell, us, you. tell us a little bit about the work you've done you. and, okay. and your preparation for the role. Uh, in the deba debate that was at New York One, I find out that they attack. They are attacking each other. Uh, is it necessary? F I don't believe. I don't want to run a negative campaign. Uh, my campaign will be based only in good ideas. I don't have money. I don't have an agenda except to help people of the District 31st that really need help. Is there any one or two things on your resume that you'd highlight for voters? Oh, in my resume, I will work hard for housing, uh, for the abusive increase of the rent, uh, for education, the, for the, against the crime, we have 
a big problem in the neighborhood with the with the drug. Okay, thank I you. would I'm like gonna, to open. I'm going to stop uh, you there. Thank you. I, I, I so, disagree with what he's saying I, because he 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 indicated in his statement that we are attacking one another. I don't feel that I'm attacking the senator. I feel that I'm just exposing the truth of facts. The fact is, she walked off the floor when when the vote for education. The fact is that uh, uh, as far as contributions, yes, we have over 9,000 contributions to our campaign, where the average contribution is under $32, whereas the senator's contributions, 500 of them or so, are from major real estate, hedge fund, charter school, and other so, places so like that. I think, you know, generally, the, the obviously, the tenor of, of this race and many other races have been fairly negative because you have challengers trying to unseat incumbents. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. my next question is this, though, uh, coming back to you, and we'll start with you, Senator yes, Alcantara. Yes, yes. As I mentioned, both of you ran uh, two years ago. It was a four-way race. There were three candidates that all got around a third of the vote. You obviously were successful. Um, but this time, there's two of the three that got a third of the vote. That means there's basically a third of the vote up for grabs. What have you done in this campaign to reach out to those voters that did not support you, they did not support Mr. Jackson last time? How do you bring new voters to your side? What have you been doing? Right, uh, we've been working, my team, when I say we, I mean my team, I've been working very hard all across the district educating our voters, having an open door policy. We, are, I believe, are the only Senate office that is open on Saturdays and uh, late hours on Wednesdays to make sure that we address the needs of those folks that don't have a traditional nine to five work hours. We have done town halls all throughout the districts on issues that are important. We make it a point in our office of addressing whatever questions our constituents have within a 24 or 48 hours period. We have had town halls on environmental to issues, um, the, you know, not using plastic bag. We have created community gardens. We have done walks all across all the parks in our district. So we have done a great job in my office in reaching out to everybody in our district. Our district is very diverse, so people have different interests. We have done a lot of work in NYCHA, um, not only in our regular NYCHA buildings, but also in our 55 and all other buildings, making sure that we reach out to everyone that is in our neighborhood. And, and Michael Lasher was the third candidate that got about a third of the vote last time around. The people that supported him, are those, are those folks that in the campaign, putting the government work aside, but I, but I heard your answer on that, put in the campaign, are those voters that you've tried to reach out to and, and convince to come to your side? You know, we reach, we send out mailers like every campaign to everybody. I do door knocking. Um, when you door knock in the buildings that you are able to get to because of security, we have tried to reach out to everyone in our district and work with everybody in our district, regardless of where they're from, because mm -hmm. we feel that that's the best way to represent. I have an open door policy, even with people that have been in my campaign and the work that I have done on issues of environment, education, and trade unionism are issues that affect everyone in the district. So, Mr. Jackson, the, let's just assume for the sake of this discussion that many or most of the voters that supported you last time will do so again, and the same thing for the senator. There is this sort of third of the vote uh, that's been up for grabs, let's say, plus per potentially many new voters. We know there's a lot of energy, obviously, in the Democratic Party. How have you tried to reach out for new support? Sure. Well, as you indicated, uh, the three of us, there were four of us in the race, but three of us basically garnered 95% uh, of the vote give or take a couple hundred. Michael Lasher, who was involved with the two years ago, uh, he is wholeheartedly supporting my, my candidacy for the New York State Senate. So the expectation is that all of the votes that he received are coming to me, uh, give or take a few. But beyond that, since Donald Trump has become president, there have been so many groups that have risen up from the ground like beautiful flowers in the springtime that are extremely involved in the democratic process. Uh, and I named some of them before, uh, No IDC NY, True Blue New York, Indivisible, Harlem Indivisible, Ind Inward Indivisible, Action Pollock. All of these groups are very active, and all of them are supporting me in this campaign. It's obvious to me and to people that are involved in the Democratic process, when you know that there are 16 Democratic clubs in the district and 15 out of 16 have endorsed my candidacy, and Marisol's own Democratic club did not endorse her. What does that say to you? When I say to you, the people of the district, they want to change. They know that she is aligned with the Republicans, and they don't need that. I've taken the pledge 
right now, and I took it two years ago, I will always be a, a, a Democrat, a true blue Democrat, and never swim across the river in order to sleep with the Republicans. Let me come back to you. I mean, I think we've obviously covered a bit of the IDC and the alignment, but um, there are a lot of people, including Michael Lasher, elected officials, community groups, political clubs supporting Mr. Jackson. Why do you think he has so much support? Is, is that something about something you haven't done or have done? Well, I can't speak. You know, that's a question that they would have to answer. One of the other gentlemen that ran the last time, Luis Tejada, is supporting me. Um, you know, Mr. Jackson comes here and makes up a lot of stories that are really interesting. But the fact is, I have the support of the entire labor movement. Almost everyone from DC 37, 1199, the Nurses Union, TWU, I come out of the labor movement. To me, to have the support of workers, to have the support of working class folks is very important. I'm proud. I respect everyone's decision. I've been endorsed by Senator Andres Stewart Cousin. Every um, women of color in the New York State Senate has endorsed me. So that speaks value and I'm proud to show the support that I have in my district. And I'm out there campaigning, door knocking in the subway stations, talking to voters about the work that I have done. Out of all the senators, new senators, I am the first senator that have I have had more bill signed into law than anyone else. Twelve of my bills have been signed into law by Governor Cuomo. So you I, mentioned, I want to move into to some other topics here. So you had mentioned in a previous uh, answer something about the MTA. So let's talk about transit. Let's talk about what can be done in Albany on that subject. So why don't you continue, Senator? What needs to be done? You mentioned you support congestion pricing, but go a little bit further. What needs to be done to help your constituents in this district and people around New York City, especially in Manhattan, get around better, fix the subways, improve the buses. Totally. For example, in my district, uh, there's a subway station on 168th Street um, along Broadway that is under construction. One of the elevators, um, the elevators have been closed because it's under construction. Um, one of my other um, stations, 163rd in St. Nicholas, is also under construction. The subway system in New York is the oldest in the country. It opens 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which I believe is the only one in the country. Um, we need to make sure that this year, the governor put over 200 and something million dollars in the budget to improve the subway system. We need to work better and find out new ideas, revenues, for example, the money that we make in, uh, from congestion pricing. We need to put the money in the subway because not only do people from New York uh, City depend on the subway, but people from the, um, from the outside. If we legalize marijuana, we can use some of the funding for education and to improve our subway system. And you do support congestion pricing, as yes, you mentioned. Yes, I do, sir. To, to, and and we you need to see to, that? Correct. Well, I support congestion pricing, and we need to get more cars off the streets. It, you know, we have a high asthma rate in the district, and we can do two things. And by congestion pricing, we can fix our asthma and our environmental issues, and we can bring in funding for our subway system. So, Mr. Jackson, then we'll come to you, Mr. Leone. The the MTA. What needs to be done in Albany? The governor needs to be able to, to deal with that because he's the primary one responsible for the MTA. As you know, the MTA board. Uh, he appoints most of them, and the mayor only appoints four. So the onus is on the state government in order to pour in the billions of dollars for infrastructure, for the, all of the computer system to be up to speed. And I agree with Marisol, we agree on this, uh, congestion pricing is necessarily important in order to reduce the congestion, the log jam in New York City, and I support that. But there needs to be a better working relationship between the governor and the mayor to work together to address the issues. And right now, it seems as though the friction is there, and I'm always hearing the governor, like, uh, pouncing on the mayor. But the bottom line is this, that the, the governor, the state of New York, is responsible for the MTA, and the primary responsibility is for the state of New York to provide the resources. And obviously, uh, we hope and expect the federal government is going to take the federal, the state, and the local, and people working together to make sure that over the next several years that the needs of the, our growing population in New York City um, deals with the MTA problem. Okay. Mr. Leon, what would so you do? I know, I know, we have to work together, first of all. And now, the way that they are doing, they cannot sit down on the table to discuss a project that we have to face. Is, for example, uh, Aidani Rodriguez 
and Adriano Espaillat, uh, Marisol, they cannot sit it together. And we need a team. In order to, to make the economy forward, we need a team. Okay. So, so another major issue obviously facing your district, uh, Manhattan and the city, is NYCHA, another big authority, but this one less of a state responsibility, more of a city responsibility. We're going to start with you, Mr. Jackson, and then come around this way. On NYCHA, $30-plus billion needed to get into a state of good repair. Similar to the MTA, there's a huge need, and we don't necessarily know where the money is going to come from. What needs to be done uh, to address the issues at NYCHA? Well, when you look at the NYCHA developments, about 21 of them are state and city developments. And the, the federal government uh, pays for about 90 percent. So the federal government basically needs to step up their responsibility. And it's my opinion, it's unfortunate uh, that under this current leadership in the White House, that that's not going to happen. That's why you have hashtag blue wave 2018 in order to try to change uh, the House and the U.S. Senate uh, to a Democratic-led so that f more funding can come to NYCHA. But clearly, besides funding, you need true leadership at NYCHA, an uh, individual that's going to make sure that all of the management people and even the online people on the ground are carrying out their duties and responsibilities. And some of the rules need to be adjusted. So. Uh, besides the funding, you need good management, and right now, I believe that that is taking place uh, under Bill de Blasio as the mayor, uh, but everyone needs to be held responsibility, and the, someone asked before, should criminal charges be brought against some of the people that have not told, uh, told the truth? And I said everyone needs to be held responsible, and if necessary, people need to be fired, people need to be fired in Wait. order to get our act together as far as night. You mentioned this idea of changing the rules. You're talking about work rules that, that sometimes have limited when repairs can sure, take place? Sure, What I'm saying is that, as you know, most of NYCHA employees are represented by unions. There needs to be negotiations as far as no, not only between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., but in the evening and late at night, if there's emergencies, they need to be dealt with. Okay, we're going to come to Senator Alcantara. Uh, on NYCHA, what needs to be done? Uh, Mr. Jackson seems to believe, obviously, that the federal government needs to step up in a much bigger way. Do you agree with that, and do you have other solutions? I have other solutions because uh, that's an issue that I have been working very closely with. I provided uh, over um, $600,000 in funding to organizations that organize tenants around NYCHA. Um, we did a survey uh, on NYCHA. I was one of three senators that called for an independent monitor of NYCHA. We did survey of over 1,000 NYCHA members, um, and after we got the result of the survey, we did a press conference where we brought the uh, number of apartments that have mold, that have lead painting, apartments that are vacant in NYCHA. And because of that, we did a huge press conference with uh, Richie Torres, with Council Member Salamanca in City Hall, bringing attention to the issue of uh, mold in NYCHA buildings. Because of that, we fought very hard in the state budget, and we put over $200 million in funding to go to NYCHA. I have tour on my NYCHA building. For example, I have a senior building that is NYCHA that has six apartments that are vacant. Why are they vacant? Because the roof is not working and it leaks into the apartment. Uh, Dykeman houses. So let me ask you, when you see uh, a roof leaking like that and vacant apartments just sitting there, what do you do? What's the, what's the first step that you do when you see something like that? I take a picture and I send it to NYCHA. Mm -hmm. And I say, look, um, you have six apartments empty. We have a homeless crisis in the city. Um, we could house six different families in these apartments. Um, I work very closely with NYCHA because I feel um, NYCHA has a population of over 400,000 people, more than the city of Newark, more than the city of Syracuse, Albany, and Yonkers. Mr. Leon, uh, on NYCHA, is there anything else that hasn't been mentioned uh, that you would try to do as a state senator? Okay. As a state sa senator, I will have a good team because if you don't have a good team around you cannot do a good work we need to be concentrated in the issue that we afford for example robert jackson is serving for the community for more than 30 years and the problem instead of getting better are getting worse we have in front of me a lot of homeless people that they are sleeping in the front of the Do you have church. any ideas about fixing NYCHA? What, what, what yeah, would you I got for? so many ideas. Sure. 
uh, as, a, as an educator that I work in the city for more than 20 years, I learned that our students need a, a technical school because they cannot learn going to a school and learn all the subjects that the teachers are explaining to them. They need to have something with the hand that they, they could learn very quick to repair a cellular phone, computer, uh, to repair a car, a lot of things they will do, but we don't have nothing. So let, me ask because group, let me ask a group follow-up about NYCHA. Nobody mentioned the idea of the state dedicating billions of dollars more in state funding, the city dedicating billions of dollars more, raising taxes perhaps, uh, infill development on NYCHA land to bring in revenue. That's something the city has been moving, inching a bit towards some mixed market rate affordable, some all affordable, but now there's discussion about perhaps some mostly market rate or all, all market rate new housing on NYCHA land to bring in revenue. I think that all of these things need to be discussed and there needs to be a comprehensive approach, not only with the city, but with the state working together. And unfortunately, the two leaders are not seeing eye to eye, but there was a, recently I heard on, on, on television and radio about an agreement to build 100% affordability for housing uh, in, in an infill, where de Blasio uh, mayor is now saying that he prefers um, market rate. And Gail Brewer, the borough president, who was a city council member at the time, said, no, the commitment was for 100 percent affordable. I go along with the commitment that was made several years ago because, quite frankly, the homeless population has been rising. And if that commitment was made as far as to move forward on other developments, it needs to be fulfilled. So I'm going to go to you. I'm going to go to you in one quick sec. The, the argument there, though, is while the affordable housing that could be built could help with the homeless situation, affordability situation, it's not really bringing in much new revenue for that $30 billion in need for NYCHA. So that's sort of what I'm getting at here is where does that $30 billion come from unless you can get the federal government to jump in in a way that it, it just it hasn't, and you indicated probably isn't anytime soon. A anything else on that revenue but, front? But then that's why the state of New York has about $185 billion uh, budget and the city of New York, $78 billion. They have to be able to, from a legislative point of view and an executive point of view, dedicate X amount of billions of dollars for that instead of reducing taxes on, on some of the wealthiers, we need to be able to dedicate billions of dollars in order to take care of this housing need because when the people are homeless, it's costing the city so much money to put them in hotels and other places, so we're wasting money. Okay. We can't waste, we have to be able to consolidate. Senator? Yes, like I said, we put over $200 million in the budget for NYCHA. Um, we have to be honest and say that NYCHA was also neglected under the Obama administration. You know, this problem with NYCHA didn't just happen. The federal government has abandoned public housing, not just in New York, but all across the nation. Um, like you said, they want to build housing in NYCHA. We need to get together with the residents of NYCHA and come up with a plan that works for everybody. Because as you stated before, um, everything sounds beautiful, but NYCHA needs money in the city of New York. And like I said, a lot of people blame the mayor, but people forget that we had other folks that were in there for 24 years, um, both Bloomberg and Giuliani, that never did anything for NYCHA. So I don't expect Mayor de Blasio to solve the issue of NYCHA overnight, but I do expect the city of New York to put a commitment to invest more money, and we need to work with NYCHA to find ways um, of bringing more money into NYCHA. Because NYCHA is under terrible conditions. Any specifics on what those ways, what you would consider well, on um, that? Maybe, you know, we want to do housing inside of NYCHA, speaking to the residents of what kind of housing they would like to see. Um, NYCHA has a lot of parking spaces. What can we do? I know that the city last year started renting out some of the parking spaces. Um, if we can um, maybe work with the tenants on ideas. And, you know, maybe some tenants want to have market rates apartment inside of the building. But like uh, it was stated before, uh, we need more affordable housing in the city of New York, period. So it doesn't sound like there's any firm commitments here on a sort of radical new approach to market rate housing on some of that parking or some of that land that would bring in 
the types of hundreds of millions of dollars potentially in revenue to, to dedicate towards repairs. That's not something that anybody feels like is on the table right now. Well, we have a homeless crisis in the city. 80,000 people live in shelters. They don't live in shelters because of a lack of luxury apartment. They live in shelter because they cannot afford to live in the city of New York. And we I think, as a yeah, city... Yeah, I think the, sep the issue is separate in terms of revenue really just dedicated for repairing the NYCHA buildings. I, I think that's also obviously part of the conversation oh, yeah. as well. I, I am Last looking, comment on NYCHA, unless I'm Mr. Leon has consideration uh, as the state senator going up there. I want to be able to examine everything. I want to hold hearings uh, in order to get the input from the government officials and from advocates in the field and from the public. And I'm open to consider everything. Uh, but the end result should be where um, that the residents are involved, as Marisol said, uh, and we come up with a plan from the federal government, the state government, and local government in order to make sure that the needs are met over a short period of time, We're not talking about 25 years. We're talking about a short period of time as far as NYCHA is concerned. We're talking about five years, 10 years at the absolute most. Anything else to add on NYCHA? Yes. Uh, we do have the fund and the, the state have the money. The only problem with this is those funds and those money are not going to the places that they're supposed to receive it. So if they use the money in the right way, I believe we will have New York the best place to live. And all the problems that we have with the homeless, with the violence and the crime and all this will be solved. And we, we have, again, a good city to live. So as a state senator, I will not talk too, too many beautiful words to confuse the voters. I will be concentrated in the issues the community have. So we don't have enough housing. And for example, uh, Marisol is endorsed by Aidani Rodriguez, who approved the rezoning. And you know, to have the, the opportunity to get an apartment for the rezoning, we need to have very high uh, salary, more than 40,000. And our workers, they hardly make 20,000 a year. So that was my next question, the Inwood rezoning that's part of the district that just passed uh, through the city council. Obviously, the de Blasio administration uh, had helped craft it and supported it. So there's and, parts of Inwood that are going to have new rules around land use. That's what a rezoning is. So Mr. Leon just expressed some real things. concern about it related to what the affordable housing is really going to be in terms of who it's going to be affordable for. So Senator and then Mr. Jackson, what are your stances on the inward rezoning? It's going forward, so what do you think about it, and what will you do next? I remember when my neighborhood, West Harlem, was rezoned in 2014. Um, we have seen um, the number of people that have moved out of our neighborhood because of that rezoning and what that means for real estate. So seeing the Inwood rezoning is like a, a playing the movie, another, the, movie, the same movie again. The Inwood rezoning, I sat down with the city on various occasions. I sat down with the labor unions and also with the groups in the community that are concerned and with, council, with the council member. Um, the city didn't address the issue of the environmental impact building those towers by the river, or what kind of, you know, we saw what happened at Bellevue Hospital with Sandy. The city didn't address the issue of infrastructure. What does that mean when you're going to have an additional 20,000 people taking the A and the one train in Upper Manhattan without building an additional space? The city didn't address the issue of Con Edison and building the infrastructure in the part of Inwood. Um, I was against the rezoning um, because I felt that the city was not clear. There's no labor agreement. Um, so we have seen the number of construction workers that have died in the city, over 30, most of them immigrants from Latin America. And I am afraid that if we're going to start construction on that on Inwood, how come we didn't address any of the any of the labor issues? So it sounds like you're largely opposed to what has Correct. been passed. Is there one specific thing to try to make it better in your view that you're going to try to do? Well, right now we are sitting, making sure um, that the lo that the jobs go to people in the in the neighborhood. 
okay. um, making sure that uh, people from Community Board 12 have access to all the new things that are going to happen in the neighborhood and that the small businesses that are there have an opportunity to move in into the new real estate space that is going to open up. Thank you. Mr. Jackson on the inward rezoning. So I was opposed to the rezoning. Uh, I, I am a member of Northern Manhattan Not For Sale. I've given testimony locally when the town hall meetings were held where hundreds of residents spoke out against it down at the city planning commission even at the city council i waited five and a half hours to speak on that as a former member of the city council i've said loud and clear that if i was the city council member i would be voting no on that particular matter because it's going to have a negative impact on the people that live there it's going to accelerate uh, gentrification Ten years ago, in the census data from 2000 to 2010, um, many people were displaced, over 20,000, mainly due to um, uh, higher rent, and most of those people moved to the Bronx. I foresee, uh, unfortunately, by the year 2020, when census is redone again, we're going to be losing more people. It should have been, you know, voted down. Uh, but, in fact, it's moving forward, and people are looking at what the options. But the, the Inward United plan was put forward by Northern Manhattan. It's not for sale. And that was the plan that we were pushing for, uh, for Adonis Rodriguez and the city of New York to take. But that okay. did not happen. So you're opposed to it. All three of you have some real uh, reservations about that plan that's moving forward. I'm going to actually move to closing statements now. So give your closing statement to the voters and viewers watching about why they should support your candidacy. Okay, to the voters, I will say, I will not do negative campaign. And they already know that both of them did something wrong in the past. I will not mention it again. That will be the last time. And you are swimming on the same boat. I'm honest, hard work, and without misdeeds and fingers that will point me. But also, I will not say this again. So I'm a hard worker, and I will fight to make New York the best pl place to live. And I will start uh, open the technical school. And I was invited uh, by the George Washington High School, where I was teaching math for 15 years. And I saw the senator uh, was with a, a baseball league. And you know, they have problems during the winter. Only one second. They have problems during the winter to, pra uh, to practice baseball. And this field could be closed very easy. And all people, they will practice baseball, football, uh, whatever the sport during the winter. Okay, got you. One idea you. for the district there. Senator, your closing yeah. statement to voters for this debate. Great. Thank you for having me here. I have passed a record for any junior senators of 12 bills that have been signed into law addressing issues of domestic violence. I have a 100% score from the environmental groups. I have done work to uplift unions and to bring a voice of a group of people that was never addressed or never had a seat at the, ten, uh, the Senate. I look forward to, in 2019, uh, um, going back to the Senate with the help of the voters of the 31st District so we can address more issues that everyday New Yorkers face in terms of immigration, women's rights, and, of course, labor rights. Thank you. Mr. Jackson, your closing statement. Well, first, let me thank Manhattan Neighborhood Network for having this forum uh, and you, Ben, as a moderator. Um, uh, my name is Robert Jackson. I'm running for the New York State Senate, and I am a true blue Democrat that I hope uh, that I receive the voters' confidence on September 13th, the Democratic primary. Um, when you look at me as an individual born and raised in New York City, the public school system, uh, involved not only uh, in the community as far as tennis association, as far as uh, on the executive board of my kids' school for 19 years, school board, city council, but my record uh, overall shows that I've been engaged in the community and has shown leadership skills uh, in every area. And as you know, my the campaign for fiscal equity, where we won billions of dollars for the children of New York. My record in the city council as a co-chair of the Black Latino Nation Caucus, we filed briefs in the stop and frisk. We filed briefs in the FDNY uh, case as far as discriminatory case. I saved thousands of teachers' jobs, fought Bloomberg administration when it came to um, 
uh, the, the unions as far as the bus drivers. And my record overall is one of advocacy and fighting for the people. The Small Business Survival Bill, I took that and I ran with it as far as I could to make sure that we protect small businesses. The first one in New York City, the uh, minority and women-owned business, Local Law 129, that occurred in the city council. That was my uh, move that forward. I say to all of you that uh, Marisol and, and the IDC were basically Trump Democrats. They've been called that by the New York Daily News. This is about a change that is needed. And when you look at my record overall, all of the Democratic clubs, all of the elected public officials are supporting me. And I hope that you understand that this is not a shell game being played. This is the truth. D vote True Blue uh, in 2018. And I hope to have your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in today's debate. And good luck on the campaign trail. And thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. Party primary elections will be held on Thursday, September 13th, and the general election will be held on Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates, you can visit the racetorepresent.com website from MNN, GothamGazette.com, or the League of Women Voters website at lwvny.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.